1, 2. Good afternoon and welcome to the reading and the talk with Judith Chelansky. We are the Goethe Institute in Hong Kong Art Center in Wan Chai. We are pleased to be again part of the International Literary Festival. And I'd like to warmly thank Catherine for her dedicated and a dedicated team for the wonderful collaboration and for the opportunity to present one of the most interesting and renowned German writers to the audience in Hong Kong. In her most recent book, An Inventory of Losses, Judith Serhansky reflects on the disappearing of unique places and things that have lost to time. What could be more relevant to Hong Kong, this fast-moving metropolis where cultural memory and rapid progress are always at war? Our moderator is Julia Kühn, professor of English literature at the University of Hong Kong, with a special research focus on Victorian literature, travel writing related to China and critical theory. Julia has been involved in the literary festival for many years. Currently, she is co-chair, and today she will facilitate the conversation with our guest. Again, a warm welcome to Judith Chalansky. Thank you, Julia, and thanks to our audience for joining us. I'm sure it will be an exciting conversation. Please, Julia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Frau Dr. Myers College and the Goethe Institute. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to welcome Judith Chalansky in Berlin. I want to talk a little bit about the location here. We are here in the library in Hong Kong with a view for the Hong Kong Harbor on a very splendid day. So I have passed around some cards. You may fill in some questions. You may ask Julia Shalansky and pass it to us. So for the online audience, please use the button to place your questions. I'm very happy to welcome Judith Chelansky. She is a German writer, one of the best German writers. She is also a book designer and editor. She had studied art history at the Free University of Berlin and communication design at the University of Applied Sciences Potsdam where she's also worked as lecturer for typography after her graduation. Her publishing activity began in 2006 with the typographic compendium Fracture Mon Amour, and then the novel Blue Doesn't Suit You and Atlas of Remote Islands, a half cartographic semi-literary book 2009 followed by a coming-of-age novel, The Neck of the Giraffe, in 2011. In 2018 um, came the book In an Inventory of Some Losses. This book was on the long list for the 2021 International Booker Prize, an extremely important international award, which followed Chelansky long, long list of German book prizes, design prizes, scholarships and other awards. Shalansky is an author, but she is also a book designer, a point to which I would like to come back later. Her books have 
repeatedly become the most visually appealing and simply the most beautiful books in Germany. And that is a quote from the Book Art Foundation when Szalansky won the first prize for the most beautiful book of the year 2012 for the Giraffes Neck. And Szalansky is an editor at the publisher company Matthew and Seitz in Berlin. Here she publishes the book series Naturkunden, which are portraits of natural investigations, one aspect of her work, which I want to come back later to. So, so as I mentioned in the beginning, this is one of the best books of the world, The Inventory of the Losses. And I welcome you here in Berlin. We will start with a short reading from chapter 11, Palace of the Republic. So at the moment, uh, we will solve some technical problems. So this is the book which I have um, is the one of the best books I have read in the past few years as a professor of literature. I read really a lot. So I hope we can start with the reading. So we will still have time to get the correct connection. We have we are not in time pressure. We will have the room even ten minutes longer than it is planned. Now we try again to get the connection to Berlin. Uh, Judith, are you there? Can you hear me? So at the moment, uh, we are trying hard to get a connection. So we had a pre-talk in the last week. We talked 10 minutes ago, but at the moment, uh, we have no connections. Yeah, yes, now we can hear you. Good. This was the right button. Great. Sometimes you can't believe how far away Hong Kong and Berlin are. So we are very happy that you are with us. And um, I have told the audience already, we will start with a short reading from chapter 11, Palace of the Republic. This book has very different voices. And if I read, so don't think that this is the whole book, but the book is really very different. The history. And the story has the title Palace of the Republic, which was the cultural and political center of the GDR. She lifted the bundle out of the string bag, unwrapped the cloth around the asparagus and laid the spares on the kitchen table. Then she fetched a couple of handfuls of potatoes from the box in the dark corner next to the refrigerator. Several of them already had green patches on them and some had even sprouted short, knobbly shoots. Evidently the box was not dark enough at all. The best way, of course, would be to store them in the cellar but then they always tasted a bit of coal. She fetched one of the gray tea towels and laid it over the box as it was a tablecloth. The hot wash in the washing machine was on its second rinse. The flak, it would be dry by the end of the day. 
as the sun had actually come out of lunchtime. All morning it had been an overcast, as it was about to rain any minute. She peeled the potatoes, slicing off a bit more where the green patches and shoots were, washed and halved them and placed them in the bowl by the cooker. She wanted to have everything prepared in advance as much as possible. At lunchtime, she had only made herself some sandwiches, even though it was Sunday. She had never liked cooking just for herself. It simply wasn't worth it. She had just started rising, rising, rinsing the scent of the asparagus spears when the doorbell rang. She quickly reached for the towel, went out in the hall and opened the door. Ah, Marlene, have you got a moment? It was Lippe. He lived downstairs across the landing on the first floor. Sure, come in. I just need to finish off in the kitchen quickly. Lippe had a worn out look about him. He was a nice, easygoing guy. Sometimes they would all sit together of an evening and have a drink, although not so much lately. Holger, not back yet? He glanced in the living room. She took her head. Lippe was studying military medicine like Holger but his specialism was stomatology. He hovered in the doorway. Really, Lippe, you should have had your shoes on, you know? Oh, well, never mind. He shrugged, he shrugged his shoulders. And the kid is having a nap. He motioned with his head in the direction of the bedroom. He really looked tired. Perhaps there was something up with Carmen. Yes, she's dead to the world. She was knackered. The fresh air, we had a quite long walk. Straight after lunch, she had drawn the curtains and put the chill down in her cot. She had bubbled for a bit, but soon it was all quiet. She had actually been meaning to prepare some lessons, but it had completely slipped her mind in the morning. Hmm. He took his hand in his trouser pocket. Jules asleep too. It's not a bad thing. A bit peace and quiet on a Sunday. She let the asparagus spares one after the other on a dry tea towel. Ha! Huh, queued up for asparagus too, did you? He took his hands off his pockets, folded his arms, grinned broadly. She couldn't help laughing. She was not the only one pinching asparagus from the field behind allotments. Green asparagus. She had never once seen it on sale in the shop. Rumor had it, it went all straight to Berlin, to the palace of the Republic. Yes, um, I hope no one who grasses on us. She dried her hands on the towel and took off her apron. Like a drink? He was still standing barefoot in the doorway. Lippe was quite a bit shorter than Holger. He had a thick, dark moustache and a receding hairline. His skin was sallow, almost boxy. No, no, I won't. He replied, I'm going to go down to the garden again in a minute. The Lippards, like themselves and a few other families from their block, had been allotted a plot in the field behind the new buildings and had cultivated it over the spring months. The soil was very sandy. They had to cut away the turf with the spade and shake it out before a thin layer of topsoil appeared and had then planted potatoes to keep the weeds at bay. Lippe, had even got hold of some fertilizers from the agricultural cooperative and set up some old cold frames to improve the yield. They had reaped a fairly meagre harvest, but she was glad of whatever she did get. Peppers, radishes, carrots, beans, parsley. They had even managed some strawberries, a small bowl full, but still worth it. Come on. Let's go to the living room. He let her past in the hall. She pulled the bedroom door to and went ahead. The sun now cast a shaft of bright light onto the aquariums, which stood on a homemade shelf units to the left of the door where Holger's fish tanks are. Guppies, black mollies, neon tetras, and a single catfish. They stayed hidden away in its hollow most of the time. In front of the aquarium stood the playpen. Lippe sat down on the section. He checked the shirt was a bit 
tied across his stomach. His sleeves were rolled up. His forearms were covered in the dark fur. Uh, Marlene, uh, uh, we... He took a deep breath. He sat forward and folded his hand in his lap. We deliberated for a long time whether we really should tell you. Strange that he referred to we, even though he was sitting there on his own in front of her. He hesitated. Well, he started again. You know, we were to Berlin yesterday. Carmen had a lecture, and I had gone along with Jewel, a long old trek, but it was worth it. Oh, yes. She had completely forgotten. And afterwards, we thought we'd given ourselves a treat. So we went into the Palace of the Republic, something a bit special, you know. And <clears throat> you see, Marlene, he said, there, he resumed, straightening his back. We, we saw three, uh, we saw, saw Holger there, you know, with another woman. He looked at her now in a compromising situation. He tilted his chin up a fraction, passed his hand over his face and slumped down slightly again. We just wanted you to know. It sounded like an apology. At first, Carmen said it was none of our business. He ran his tongue over his teeth. But this morning I said to her, how would you feel if Merlene spotted me somewhere with another woman who didn't say anything? A compromising situation. Really? Poor Lipper, such a nice guy. Much nicer than Carmen, with a severe plaid and her beauty spot just above the mouth on the left-hand side, which looked as if it had been drawn on. I don't know what to do either. His right foot bobbed up and down. Perhaps you'd like to have a chat with Carmen, you know, women to women. Carmen was a pharmacist. She had never really felt comfortable in her company. I don't think he noticed us. The table was green. They had painted it themselves. They thought it would be kind of nice. Thank you, she said. Lippe stood up. I'll get going. He whipped his hands on his trouser legs. She heard him slip his shoes on in the hall, close the door of the flat and go down the stairs. The dust danced in the light. Actually, the table looked vile. Thank you. This is uh, wonder, wonderful. This is my most favorite chapter. With this photographic um, um, situation, the green table, this green table, which is actually not so nice afterwards, after the news of the affair, the loss of the architectural and political symbol of the Palace of the Republic, the loss of the love, the difference, and the discrepancy with the outside and the inside the mankind at palace. So here is the telephone which is just ringing. Please uh, switch out your phone. My first question regarding this art form, the genre. So you said already, don't uh, expect that the whole book is like this. So this book is very different. So it is a short story, is it a natural literature? Is it a biography? Is it? We have, um, it is like a travel literature, like Twanaki, like a unicorn or Gueric unicorn, a natural literature, or a castle of bears, a memoir, or is it a Caspian tiger, a fictional, sorry? or a photographic. This is very surprising and full of very playful book. So, so what do you think about it? What, how the Palace of the Republic fits in this? 
This book is like a wonder room. It's an invention of the Baroque time. So where you didn't uh, separate the different arts, the culture and the art. So we have skeletons, we have unicorn, you have uh, everything together, even like shells. So the important thing, like in museums in the past, are that these are wonder rooms where you discover many new things. You, I think this book has to do with a lot And also I'd have designed the cover. So I always have something oscillating between three and two dimensions. And when you go in the book, you always see different rooms appearing. And I want to create some spaces in the book where you can really walk in and experience. Especially in the GDR. And this is like an experience of children when they put in everything in small boxes and uh, create your own sphere. And I want to create a very strong form. And I created the same length of each text yeah, and to put many different things into these small boxes of texts. And I understand the wonder rooms very well. So how did you start this book? The last time I talked with you, you were on the way to the state library to do some researches. Can you talk a little bit how you had the idea to start this book? The great thing in the book is Without the pressure to write footnotes, I uh, go back to the 19th century like a researcher to research about my book, to write about my book. And it is quite a big volume. So I talked about the religion, which the Buddhism, which lasted from China to Europe. I have worked months to create the texts. And because I have absorbed everything to create a literal text, to create a 
new research about this. And I try to write everything new. So I created a new uh, compost. Uh, I create new homos to have something out of it. So it is a fantastic book. Can you talk a little bit about the design of the book? I want to ask about the cover as well. And here I want to show you here the cover that you can see how it looks like. To open such rooms, which I have presented, I have imagined that you have many entrances to enter in the book. So nobody is reading from the beginning A to Z. So I want to have many entrances in the book. I like if the books allow you to jump from pages and from tab chapter to chapter. And here I have uh, black colored pages, so I have separated those chapters. You can so you can better jam, jam from, uh, jump from one chapter to another. So you can feel it. So it is quite interesting to have a digital um, conversation, but here you nearly have to feel it, how you... So like in an in and out tray, you have here the separation between the chapters. If you to take a really close look, and here you can imagine it looks like a, it's really black print. So, and it is a minimal idea to have a second thought. Since the paper is dark gray, so you have an aura, an aura of some ghosts, some spooky things. And like you take pictures of some ghosts. And I like this especially, this in and off of some pictures. And I really had to talk with the editor if we can realize this one in a print as well, because what I do by hand, sometimes it's not possible to work in the industry. So I had to discuss if we can really produce this in the print industry. I always have the opportunity um, I have the, I really think that we have to check this up beforehand. And there are different signals. And um, it, it is quite difficult to put uh, the book into a fictional or in a non-fictional genre. And I hope that you, as a specialist as a tr for travel journals, and I think 
I hope that you can understand this. It is always difficult to put in this work in boxes. And I also want to write about the death and the dead people. And and uh, that is the reason I also mentioned the uh, date of death of all the mentioned people in the book. The wonderful thing is, and I'm happy that and if, if, for example, Alexander the Great is mentioned, that the pop singer Alexandra mentioned as well. And I support this, especially with the preface and the compendium. It looks like a small collecting box. We could talk more specific about the wonderful experiences in travel journals. And for many hundred years, there were so, written so many interesting things in the travel journals, you can't imagine. And <clears throat> You want to bring this back to life, that we wonder about new experiences. So we have the concepts today. This is a false news or he has lied about it. But in the past, there were times we really believed in, in wonders and we more often used talking about them. So, so there is no question in the past that they were just talking about uh, unicorns because they had fun doing it and wondering where you can caught it. I did the book so I wanted to write a book about uh, monsters but I have uh, was not successful so um, then I tried to write uh, this book to show more wonders so and I think this is successful since you can't put it in two boxes that I was successful showing all the different wonders so, so in the monster in the unicorn chapter there are also a lot of description of nature And I want to talk a little bit about this aspect, about the nature. So, I'm a big fan of travel literature. I love Captain Cook's journals. So I admire Robert McFarlane, the English author, whose work you want to introduce to German readership in Naturkunden. These are natural portraits. You are the curator for this series. Hmm? The chapter of the inventory of some losses, the port of Christophers, is one of the most poetic works of nature writing that I have ever read a long time. 
tell us a little bit more about what, what fascinates you all about nature and the description of natives. So here is the book about the remote islands. So what does interest you in the world, in the nature? So just the astonishing and the surprising things, this is connected uh, to the wonderful things, what I mentioned earlier. So, the travel journal is about experience in foreign places, and this is fascinating me at all. And in the atlas of the remote islands, I have shown it that I need to show that the people can lose about their whole self and experience new things. And I find it very fascinating that this very, on this text, which describe in the text a new reality. And yeah, I begin with the listing of all the things, and this is my start of writing. And uh, with this writing, I take ownership of these ideas. So, actually, there is no inventory of losses, hmm? because you absorb it inside. So everyone has some inventory of losses, like when you lose your flat when it's burned down. But I take ownership of it when I write it down. So, and here I combine the nature with the cultural science and cultural history. Often there are political situations involved to avoid civil war, to, it's about anarchism, It's a tragic thing in the German room that the nature is just um, transferred to the natural science and no longer lively in the literature. This is, I'm very sad about this. And there is a break of um, history. And I want to create new words and new descriptions about natural phenomena. And I want to sharpen our view. And we want to be more aware. We want to, uh, we only see the things which we know are there. And if we don't write it down, we don't realize that we have lost something, like in the environmental destruction. So, and so it is here a form of, uh, put it into an archive. 
and I had big problems to describe the different things. So my parents, they already knew what was growing on the fields, but I didn't know the, all the vegetables. So, and I realized we didn't teach our children how the birds are called. And then I realized we lose the languages first. And when we don't have the language anymore, then we lose a part of our identity. May I remind you in the audience to uh, write down some questions or press the button online to place your questions. Judith is happy to answer. I want to come back for the biographical aspects. Several chapters in the book Inventory are dedicated to your first home in Greifswald. So can you tell us a little bit more how much biography is in this book? And above all, how much GDR life is there? This seems to be a very personal book. Yes, it is very personal. So because I miss the system. And there are many things which I miss. That is the reason it is in the plural form. These are some things which has um, formed me and which I really miss. And they have disappeared now. And this is the fact that we cannot return to the country of our childhood. But we have uh, lost a complete system of reference, of rules and experiences. And uh, this also plays a role in the book, uh, since, for example, the political system didn't are not was not interested in to preserve the architecture or old buildings. And there was always the wish to have a new start. And there was the wish to leave home and start a new life elsewhere. And my parents also separated very early and this was of influence. Because the neighbor told about uh, the relationship of one of my parents and it was true and this has formed me very much in my childhood. And this, of course, was a story which I have experienced on my own. I did not do any research for it. So I used my parents as protagonists in the literary and to have some history, family history. So And then I had, so then uh, how can I include it into a story? And then I came, had the idea, I write a kind of American short story and insert it like this into my novel. And I wanted to write about the daily life in the GDR and about their specific forms. 
<laughs> and uh, the best um, comments about my book was uh, I have recreated the GDR. So I was very happy about these comments. And this is quite interesting since I talked about the history in the genre of the short story. So I have sent the book to my mother who grew up in the East. And she remembered um, that time, the time of the holidays she spent with her grandmother and she found out the atmosphere in the book is really quite the same as her memories. So I want to talk about some translations, but beforehand I want to ask you if there are any questions. So I have, I want to ask the audience, and so I will pass around the English and Chinese translation at the moment. <clears throat> the book was translated by Jackie Smith as Inventory of Losses. And it was on the long list of the 2021 National Book Award for Translated Literature. And you work with renowned award winning, but also newer translators. Personally, I think translating is as much as an art as creative writing. Uh, can you talk me about the translation process? A process. Are you involved with the translation? And I think at the moment your books have been translated into over 20 languages. How you find your translators? Will you trust them? Yes, of course, I will trust them without trust. It's not possible. I can only do it when I know the language. So, I checked the English translation. The English translation is like a second original. I spend weeks checking it. And I really find this translation is fantastic. I really love the words. I had the big luck. I had uh, 10 female translators and one male translator, and I worked together with them in a small village near the Netherlands German border. There was a small college where the translator are meeting. And in four days, we went through the book and hence translated the book in this location. And uh, this book is also like an archive and has so many different genres and it was really fun to work together. I'm very proud that this book also shows that the translators can do it and can what the translators can work about it. It has a long history uh, up to 1850, and we had a, used a lot of small books from our library to check it. 
And even the Italian translation, for example, shows the magic very well. So the questions are coming at the moment. So where did you get uh, your motivation to write sad stories? Where comes this sadness from? That's interesting. But uh, I'm really not so sad. I think... Melancholic feelings is something different than sadness. because other things are present in this feeling. In the psychoanalytic research, there is the sadness, something positive which brings the person forward, can be funny, can be a ritual, the sadness can be a ritual during um, burials, for example, when the people eat together after a burial. When you come back from the war and also talk about funny stories, this can also happen. That is the reason we live to create art. There is the celebration of life, but there is also the other. There is the other thing, what we have lost. But we have to understand only something when we have lost it. And then we have the phantom pain when you will lose a um, body part and then you still feel the pain, for example. This is also happening. But we always have the lust of life. We want to create something new. We always recreate our own history. Especially when we talk about our life history, which we will change continually, continuously. And this is something exciting going on. And this is uh, not an opposite, huh? this is just the reality. So, of course, you are right. During a burial afterwards, uh, they tell stories about the life of the dead person. Yeah, so how how do you make the seemingly ordinary in something extraordinary? Wow. That's a good question. This is something with um, magic potion, with icy mystics. I will do it with language. I worked five years on these 250 pages, and I started uh, so often again. And I wanted to find where is the 
tone. Here I must he, here I must avoid uh, pathetic slogans. It is something strange. When you find the right words, then, then your mind is opening up and you write with brackets and slashes and then you throw it away and then I'm looking for synonyms and then I print it out and then I find it's a matrix and then I strike out what I don't like and I work like um, artist working on stones and um, put away what I don't like. It is a very hard work. And I think the writing as I do it is uh, not possible without uh, doing it in a faster way. I need to form it like a stone. So, one question from the audience, please. You draw inspiration from lots of sources from nature and experience. Are you writing consciousness or without consciousness? I really don't know if I can answer this. Uh, I'm interested in the rooms in between, in between the consciousness and the unconsciousness. I'm interested in those ghosts. And I have absolved psychoanalytical um, during my life, and I have studied and worked in it. And uh, it is, has much in common with the literature and language. And I want to trace after those stories. And good stories in life or in literature. And they, have, they are very ambivalent. They have many levels. They have uh, not one solution, but different. They are many folds. And they are more interesting. And I also write books to learn more about myself, to find my own rooms and to measure them out. And to explore my own view of life and view of the world. And I want to experiment. And I always see the connection in between rooms. And it is something universal. And I'm very happy that this book and this topic is understood worldwide. And the worldwide it is understood there are conscious and unconscious elements in this book. That is an excellent answer. Thank you very much. 
So now we are coming to an end. So there are always losses. So islands, buildings, governments, life, everything comes to an end. Thank you very much, Judith Chalansky. Thank you very much for the stimulating conversation. So I want to encourage you to buy the book and to give it as a present. Thank you very much. It's a good Christmas present. Thank you for the audience. And thank you for your interesting question. Thank you, Anne Almut from the Goethe Institute, that you make this conversation possible. Thank you for our simultaneous translator, Frank Ulrich Gast, and to Lukas, Lok, Josef, and Jasmine for communication and product action. So, you, they will still work on the 15th of November. So, come visit our website. The literary festival take place from the 5th to the 15th of May. So, uh, we, we get support for the government or for language and education. And Bookesim and Financial Times, they are our partners as well. And thank you also for the Goethe Institute and the local arts organization. Thank you that you're organizing and helping the Hong Kong Literary Festival. I wish you a nice Sunday. So it was so wonderful. Thank you very much. And all the best to Hong Kong and Berlin. <laughs>